Black holes, they certainly seem to have captured our imagination, don't they? From the Muse song to Interstellar, Star Trek, they're practically a staple of science fiction. But more than that, real life scientists also find them extremely fascinating. Astronomers are on the verge of actually seeing black holes out there, and theoretical physicists like myself have always been drawn to them and almost sucked in. Why is that? <laughs> well, one reason is that they're mathematically incredibly simple objects. I could write down a black hole for you in a single line. That's shorter than a grocery list, though you might not want to take it to the store with you. And of course, in spite of that apparent simplicity, this sort of hides some very exotic properties of black holes that actually start to take us towards the quantum frontier of the universe. And in some sense, black holes provide us with a tool at which we can test our ideas about how nature works at its most fundamental level. A lot of my research has been about the unexpected with black holes, surprising things that can happen when you start to mix them with quantum objects or processes in unusual ways. And what I want to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to try and communicate to you these two sides of the black hole. On the one hand, the tangible, real object that's out there and how it works. And on the other hand, this theorist's toy. We always play with it. Why is it we are so fascinated by it? And what I hope to communicate to you is that I find black holes really cool objects, both because they're out there, but also because I can see them on a page in front of me on my desk. So what is a black hole? Simply put, it's an object that's big enough, massive enough, or concentrated enough that gravity is really strong, so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. So that's a very sort of simple sentence. It's a simple image, but there's actually quite a bit of science contained in that. So let's actually take a closer look. Gravity. Well, I thought that uh, Quaron did a really stunning job of actually conveying the beauty and power of gravity in his film. But of course, we know how it works as physicists, and it's what keeps us on this planet. Gravity is a force, so if we want to leave the planet, we have to get ourselves up to a fairly high speed, about 25,000 miles per hour, in fact. And we call this the escape velocity. In fact, it took that huge Saturn V rocket and all its power just to get the little Apollo spacecraft and the astronauts away from the Earth's gravity and off to the moon. And to kind of get a feel for how powerful gravity is, because I think we often forget about it when we're standing on the Earth. If you wanted to send me into orbit, or I wanted to send one of you into orbit, and that's just me, not an environment to live in, it would be to take the same amount of energy as exploding about a ton of TNT. So that, that's quite a lot of energy. So, whoops. <laughs> So that's, since it's a force, it also actually depends on distance. Gravity is what we call an inverse square force. And what that means is that if we go twice as far from an object, gravity becomes a quarter as strong. Or conversely, if we were to push the Earth into half its size, gravity would become four times as strong. It's also dependent on how heavy something is. So Roughly speaking, the bigger the object, the more mass it has, the stronger gravity is. So for the sun, that's about 300,000 times as heavy as the Earth, but it's only about 100 times as big. Gravity is much stronger at the surface of the sun, and this escape velocity I was talking about is about 60 times as big. But 25,000 or 100,000 miles an hour 
while big, is still something we can imagine. So let's go beyond. Let's imagine making the sun heavier and heavier so this escape velocity gets higher and higher, and then it eventually reaches the speed of light. Now, you might think that imagining escape velocity of the speed of light is some 20th century invention, but it isn't. It was imagined back in the 18th century by John Mitchell, a Cambridge Don. In those days, they didn't know if light was a wave or a particle. We now know it's both. But they did know it had finite speed. And so it was not so crazy to imagine a star that might be big enough that light couldn't get out, and the star would go dark. What's crucial about 20th century physics is the implication of that statement. So the thing about light is that relativity tells us it's an absolute speed limit. You don't get an extra 10% or so before the cops pull you over. It's a hard line. You shall not pass. You cannot go faster than light. And so this surface, where the escape velocity is the speed of light, it's like a horizon on Earth. It's a limit of what we can see. But it's also more than that. It's actually a limit of anything that we can ever see beyond, because nothing can come out if light cannot. And so we call it an event horizon. And since anything behind it is lost to us forever, it really is like a hole in space. So what's the big deal, you might say? OK, it's a one-way ticket, but maybe I like one-way tickets. Well, I wouldn't advise you to buy this one. Because in the 60s, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking proved that if we made some very simple assumptions about the type of matter that we have and assumed also general relativity was true, then inside the black hole, there's something that we call a singularity. And that really is bad news. So whereas Newton's gravity could give us a star that was heavy enough that light couldn't escape, Einstein's gravity gives us almost a monster where once we've fallen in, it won't let us go, and then it'll crush us into oblivion at this singularity. So black holes can sound pretty exciting and maybe even a little bit scary. But are they really out there? Well, the answer is yes, we do believe they are. We have two sorts of black hole that we're fairly confident are out there. The first is what we would call a stellar black hole. This is something that forms when a star has reached the end of its life, it runs out of nuclear fuel to burn, and then collapses in and forms one of these black holes. Back in the 30s, Chandra Sekhar calculated that for a star to form a black hole, it had to be have, have more than about three solar masses, had to be heavier than about three times the sun. Beyond that point, the star would inevitably collapse to form a black hole, but our sun won't. The other type of black hole that we know is out there is that little clip that I showed at the beginning, the supermassive black hole. That's an enormous black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's about a million solar masses. And it was found by very carefully watching stars at the core of the galaxy whipping round by galactic standards, something in the middle, something that was dark and something we couldn't see. And so that is what the supermassive black hole is. So what are the properties of these black holes? Well, a black hole turns out to be quite a small object relatively speaking. If our sun was to suddenly be made into a black hole, it would be about four miles across. The supermassive black hole is about the size of the sun, roughly speaking. And if our Earth were squashed into a black hole, it would be about an inch across. Note that I'm using imperial units for this audience, by the way. <laughs> I had to, had to calculate all that out. <laughs> So those all sound everyday numbers, don't they? But just imagine the whole of the Earth squeezed into something an inch across. Ouch, that's quite painful. 
And so what this brings me to is the next key property of black holes, which is their tidal forces. So on Earth, we're used to tides. Certainly in Britain and Ireland, we're very used to tides. Essentially, we can think of tides as being formed by the moon dragging the seas with it as it orbits the Earth. And then the sun and the moon together combined give us spring and neap tides. But tides are a bit more. Actually, tides are really the forces in general relativity. I was a bit naughty when I called gravity a force at the start, but it's really how we intuitively think of it. I'm afraid gravity isn't really a force in general relativity because, of course, everything's relative. Einstein threw out a lot of absolutes. Gravity becomes straight lines on a curved space. But tidal forces are real. They're telling us something about how this curvature changes from one point to the next. And the tidal forces are where black holes start to get really interesting and, I suppose, a little bit scary again. Tidal forces go like the inverse cube of distance, not an inverse square. So for a tidal force, that means smaller objects are more extreme. So a stellar mass black hole has a tidal force of something like a billion G per meter. That's a huge great gravity gradient. The supermassive black hole, on the other hand, their tidal forces are only about a G per meter. I mean, that's pretty big by human standards, but it doesn't sound so bad, at least. And of course, the Earth, well, I don't think we really want to think too carefully about that. That would be pretty horrendous being drawn into something like that. So black holes, with their tidal forces, this is where we get towards the more extreme properties of black holes. What if we could go beyond the Earth? What if we could have really small black holes? Surely their tidal forces would be stupendously big. And this brings me now to the part of black holes that start to interface with the quantum world. So it's essentially the sort of outstanding problem in theoretical physics is to really understand and appreciate the quantum side of gravity. It took quite a long time for black holes to be accepted by the scientific community. They were first discovered in 1916, only one year after Einstein had written down his theory of general relativity. Schwarzschild, actually in the trenches, believe it or not, came up with this solution. A very simple solution, the one-liner that I referred to earlier, and he sent it to Einstein. Einstein was very impressed but he felt that this was something that was beautiful mathematics rather than real physics. And so the story of black holes sort of lasted for about half a century as we gradually worked out what these mathematical objects were and teased out the real physics from the very simple, pure mathematics. Until by about the six, late 60s, we were very comfortable with them, we thought we knew them, we understood them, we felt they were out there, and we even christened them. We called them black holes. But no sooner had we accepted them into the fold, so to speak, than a new problem emerged. It seemed as if black holes were going to go head to head with another very successful theory of large-scale physics, the physics of heat or thermodynamics. The problem was that if we had black holes in the universe, we could imagine them as a sort of universal vacuum cleaner going around, sort of clearing up all the junk in the universe. And the problem with that is it violates a law of physics called the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us that disorder must increase. So this was what led Beckenstein to conjecture that maybe black holes have this property called entropy, which balanced this equation. And then, of course, Stephen Hawking proved that black holes actually radiated just like we might expect a thermal body to do. And he calculated the temperature of a black hole. Now things get interesting, especially for our little black holes. So the temperature of a black hole is proportional to 1 over its mass, which means that bigger black holes are cooler, smaller black holes are hotter. So if you are on sort of thinking about this, you might say, OK, 
I have a black hole of a certain mass, and it radiates at a certain temperature. But hang on. If it radiates, then that means that it loses mass, which means it gets hotter. So it radiates more, loses mass faster, gets hotter, and so on and so forth. Isn't that a runaway process? And the answer is yes, it does seem to be that that is the case. So if we have these small black holes, aren't they a problem? So small black holes, to be, I'll be honest, we're not 100% sure if they're out there. But if they are, then the only way they could have formed was in the very early universe, when the environment was sufficiently dense and extreme enough for them to form. And we have a name for them. We call them primordial black holes, because they're right from the dawn of time. So what could happen to these very small black holes if they're around? So this brings me to some of the work that I've been doing recently. We've been looking at the effects of small black holes on something called vacuum decay. Now, this is a rather exotic quantum process that's somewhat like radioactive decay. And it occurs because what we mean by the vacuum or empty space may not be entirely stable. Now, the discovery of the Higgs boson uh, by the LHC in Geneva was actually a real triumph for us theorists. We constructed this wonderful theory called the Standard Model that explained how all the particles that were made of interact. And we pretty sure we knew it was true. It was you know, fairly nice mathematically. We had all this evidence, but it relied on this funny thing called a scalar field. And for a long time, this scalar field had not been seen. But then, finally, in 2012, the LHC actually saw the Higgs boson, measured its mass, and everyone was happy. There was just a slight little rider, one of these little asterisks, you know, read the terms and conditions. There's just a little problem. <laughs> the mass that was measured by the LHC of the Higgs boson is sort of one of, the, one of these masses that if you believe the standard model holds to very high energies, it tells us that this vacuum that we live in is not entirely stable. And so our universe is a bit like some big uranium nucleus, nucleus just poised, waiting to blow apart and decay. People weren't too concerned because some calculations done about 20 or 30 years ago seemed to indicate that the half-life for this process, how long it might take an individual thing to do, an individual matter, or universe in our case to decay, was trillions of years. So that really didn't sound too, too bad. But that was before mini black holes came along. The problem with these earlier calculations was that they assumed the universe was a very featureless and smooth place. And of course, we know it isn't. And so what we did was we added a little black hole to the mix and tried to see what happened and got a very surprising answer. The life half-life went down from trillions of years to sort of less than nanoseconds. It made an enormous difference. It was almost like the sort of strong distortion of space-time around one of these mini black holes was acting like a fracture point for the vacuum of the universe and was going to allow it to sort of hop over into this state that would end life as we know it. You know, I feel like one of these you know, people saying, repent for the end is nigh. Well, of course, that's not really what I'm saying. Because really what we do in theoretical physics, we're really like Sherlock. We kind of always try to deduce things and eliminate impossibilities. So I'm standing here, so clearly the end of the universe is not really a possibility. So what's it telling us? It's telling us that if small black holes exist, and if this standard model holds to high energies, then we have a problem. So obviously, either we don't have small black holes, or the standard model doesn't hold at high energies. And to be honest, we've more or less resigned ourselves to that latter option being the case. What's really cool here, though, is that we are getting to that conclusion by thinking about black holes, 
using gravity in an area of physics that often pretends gravity just doesn't exist. So once again, black holes are challenging our perception of the quantum frontier. Often in physics, we tend to focus on a particular aspect of a problem. Is it quantum or is it classical? Is it big or is it small? Is it beautiful mathematics or is it real physics? And one of the things that's really amazing about black holes is that they transcend all these boundaries. They are both beautiful mathematics and real physics. We can have big ones and we can have small ones. But most importantly, they actually provide us with an object, a tool that allows us to test our perceptions of this quantum frontier and allows us to sort of push against what we know about the quantum and the classical in our world. And with any luck, they may help provide a piece of the puzzle that actually takes us beyond Einstein and his beautiful theory of general relativity that's celebrating its centenary this year. Thank you.